Hi, and welcome to the talk on the science behind lifestyle medicine, how simple changes can improve your mental health. My name is Catherine Van Tassel. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a physician assistant board certified in lifestyle medicine. I'm really excited to spend some time with you talking about mental health and what we can do in terms of lifestyle to help improve our mental health um, and then also to be very preventative in terms of brain health. So you don't necessarily need to have a diagnosed mental health condition to get a lot out of this. We're really going to talk about stress and sleep and um, so many tools that we can use to be preventative in terms of mental health and treatment of um, stress, anxiety, depression. So to start, um, I'm gonna go through an overview of mental health, and then we're gonna talk about stress management techniques, benefits of nutrition, exercise, community, and sleep. Okay, so let's just step back and take a, a look at what mental health is looking like today. So the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So I think that this is really important because to be well doesn't mean that we don't have a lack of a disease state, meaning that there are so many things that we need um, in terms of physical health and mental health and social well-being to be happy, healthy, whole people. Not just to say that I don't have any diagnosed conditions or the conditions that I have are, um, are stable. There's lots, there's lots more we can do, especially in terms of brain health. Major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability in the US for ages 15 to 44, um, which is pretty significant. And that ends up being a good portion of working years as well, which can be impactful financially in terms of meaning and purpose. 800,000 people worldwide sadly lose their lives to suicide each year. This works out to be about one every 40 seconds. We're also seeing um, our youth being more impacted by um, suicide than we've ever seen before. Um, so again, it's so important to be destigmatizing mental health, talking about stress management, um, so that it's okay to say we might not be doing okay right now. And then we know that the rate of if you have a diagnosed anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder, any type of psychiatric disorder, that you're also at a higher risk of having a substance use um, disorder. And, and that's because it can be very painful to have um, a mental health condition. And so looking for an outlet, even if it may not be the healthiest. And then one in five Americans have a diagnosed mental health disorder. Um, that's diagnosed each year. Um, but that doesn't mean that those, that is, um, if you were to go into a doctor and have somebody diagnose you in terms of criteria from the DSM-5, however, that number doesn't even capture those that might be losing sleep because of stress, whether that's at home, whether that's at work, um, or somebody that might be more anxious or just feeling down and depressed because of a situation that's happening in their life. So these are just diagnosed mental health conditions, not those that are suffering because of um, a high time of stress or some sort of situational issue that's going on. And then we see that many adults think about or attempt suicide. So 12.2 million people have seriously thought about suicide and 3.2 million people have made a plan for suicide. And then sadly, we see this progressing to 1.2 million having made an attempt. So this is so critical. This is why we're talking about it. Um, we're having conversations like this, which I think is fantastic. This is, um, COVID was so hard on so many of us for so many reasons. Um, but if we look at the glass half full or any benefit or good that we got from it, talking about mental health, destigmatizing it, making change and making change in the workplace um, 
is definitely a new movement, I think, that we got from um, the pandemic. So I would say that that is definitely a positive that we need to make sure that that momentum um, continues. And again, just some more um, importance why we're talking about this, because we're just losing too many people. And if you or someone you know is in crisis, please use 988 to call um, the crisis line. You'll be routed to somebody um, in your area. Um, and this is completely confidential. Um, and even if you're just worried about somebody or you want some resources, feel free to use this, um, this number um, for somebody that you might know or if yourself, you happen to be in crisis. Okay, so a lot of that's very heavy um, and kind of the bad news story here. But what's the good news? The good news is, is we have so many tools that are research backed. We have very good science. So at the beginning, I told you I'm board certified in lifestyle medicine. Um, I have spent years both doing this in clinics. So seeing real tangible outcomes um, with patients in terms of um, implementing these strategies into their life, and then the research that I learned to implement these. So I've seen it on both ends and how it's incredibly effective. Um, and the beauty about this is that we have not one tool, but many tools. And usually if you weave a few of them together or some aspect of all of them, it really ends up being this wraparound care for ourselves um, and for our loved ones in terms of being mentally well. And it also, when we're mentally well, that also changes how we are physically. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, but what are all these tools that we have? So movement. I don't want anyone to think that they have to go out and run a marathon or have a formal exercise plan. For some people, that's fantastic for them. Um, but for some people, going to the gym or um, doing workout classes, that doesn't work for them, but walking outside with their dog or their family, um, being outside in nature, whether that's hiking or mountain biking or biking, um, but movement is incredibly powerful for our body, especially when we get outside into nature. What we put in our mouth, our professional and personal development, so having this purpose in life, um, what your physical environment's like, relationships um, and communication, spirituality, um, and mind-body connections. So we're thinking about yoga and some forms of therapy. Um, we have all of these tools that really help, and these can both be used as preventative or as interventional. I love this quote by Thomas Edison. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame. In diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. So really speaking to what I'm gonna talk about here. Okay, so just to be thorough, what does major depressive disorder look like? And also what does anxiety look like? There are many other mental health conditions and um, this is not to say that those aren't just important, um, but we're really talking about um, some of the most common um, that we see in terms of being affected by the, um, the greatest amount of people. Um, and something that a lot of us have been familiar with the terms, we hear about major depressive disorder and anxiety. So what does this look like? Well, for major depressive disorder, this can be sad or irritable mood, major changes in sleep, appetite and energy, difficulty thinking and concentrating and remembering, um, physically slowing down or restless, reoccurring thoughts of death or suicide, like it's just too hard to be here. I, I'd rather not be here. Um, or maybe other people would be better off if I wasn't here. Our brain really tells us things that aren't true. Um, lack of interest or in pleasure of doing the activities that we loved. So let's say somebody loves gardening and now they're not gardening at all, even though it's beautiful and sunny outside. Um, just not participating in things that they really enjoyed. Feelings of guilt and worthlessness, hopelessness and emptiness. Um, physical symptoms that don't respond to treatment, such as headaches, digestive disorders, and pain. So we see this, people that have chronic pain conditions, their pain is worsened when their mood um, is not cared for or is not treated if they have a diagnosed mental health condition. 
And then generalized anxiety disorder, difficult to control worry, restlessness, just feeling like oh, things are just going to explode. Difficulty concentrating or your mind going blank. We'll talk about why this concentration, mind going blank, feels like you're, you're reading the same sentence twice. You're not get, getting any of the information. We'll talk about why that happens. Being easily fatigued, irritable, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. So these are some of the symptoms that we would look for. But I really want to highlight, you can have some of these symptoms and not have a formal diagnosis, um, but experience these. So this is when I was talking at the beginning that one in five people will have, they'll meet the criteria to be diagnosed with this. Um, but then most every single person is going to have felt one of these ways at some point in their life due to situational um, issues in their life. And that's why it's so important to have all of these tools. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about is stress management. So what can we do? And I'm sure we've probably all heard about some forms of stress management, maybe you've gone to a class on that. I'm hoping that I'll bring up some new things or a different perspective um, to look at that. So one of the tools that um, I wanted to bring up that again, everything I'm talking about is very much rooted in research is, um, uh, is this, so first of all, mindfulness, is just um, being aware of your thoughts and not having any judgment around them. Mindfulness has become this buzz term, um, this buzzword that we throw around or we hear thrown around a lot. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, a lot of maybe judgment or preconceived notions about what it takes to have a quote unquote mindfulness practice. And I think some people feel like you need to have an hour to practice mindfulness, or it's um, a situation where you're sitting quietly and not having any thoughts go through your mind for a considerable amount of time, or it may be something that feels too ambiguous to actually understand or grasp or practice. And this is where I'm trying to make things very accessible to get into. And then if you've already started, how can you expand on that? So when we think of mindfulness and how I explained it and just being aware of our thoughts without judgment, this is the starting place of that. And you can start um, in this place by just going on a five minute walk. And when you're on that five minute walk that you tap into your five senses. So for one minute, what can you see? For one minute, what can you smell? For one minute, what can you feel? So think if it's really cold outside, what is that cool sensation or maybe freezing sensation feel like on your face? Or the opposite, if the sun's out and it's heating up your body and you can feel the sun warming your skin, just focusing on that for one minute. What does it feel like? So when you're walking, can you feel the leaves crunching underneath your feet? Can you, um, are there rocks? Is the ground um, hard, the pavement hard? How do your feet feel today? Have you been standing a lot? Have you been sitting a lot? And it feels really good to move your body and so on. So this is a five minute practice that you can tap into mindfulness. Also you're out moving your body. So if you are somebody that it's difficult for you to sit still or your mind's always racing, this is a great entry into a mindfulness practice, a walking mindfulness. But when you're doing this, you get physiological changes in your body from the stress response. Think of that like that fight or flight, run from the um, bear or the tiger into this rest and digest. That is where mindfulness comes in in terms of the research, where we see it's impactful for stress management, for mood, it helps with concentration, and that even helps people that have chronic diseases um, in terms of either the stress from that chronic disease or some of the pain, so helping with pain management. And then there's a very specific mindfulness um, program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. So remember I said, I'm gonna try and give some tools for just entry level. Okay, let's do this five minute walk or, okay, what if you've been doing this and you wanna deep dive deeper? This has been really impactful for you and you would like to do more. There are books and there's actually classes and certifications that you can take in mindfulness-based stress reduction which are really powerful and um, great to look into. Um, look at a local university to see if they have an ongoing education class on this. 
Um, and we can see that this is really effective in people with mood disorders. So um, those that have had multiple relapses in terms of major depressive disorder, um, having a mindfulness-based stress reduction um, program is helpful in not having another relapse. Um, so it's decreasing the reoccurrence of depression. And um, in some studies, they've seen that it's even um, as effective as medication for relapses. Um, and this is based on the work of John Kabat-Zinn. So if you're interested in getting a book. Um, he also has YouTube uh, videos that you can watch. So low entry, free entry. Um, and then there's other tools out there as well that um, we can talk about that you can use for that. So this is going into what I uh, mentioned about when you start doing something like a mindfulness practice, how it takes you out of that fight or flight and into the rest and digest. And this is a really good infographic to show you what happens when you get stressed out. So you have your parasympathetic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system. You don't have to remember those names, um, but just think as the parasympathetic is your rest and digest and the sympathetic is your fight and flight. And you can see, depending on where you are, there's a different physiological response that happens in your body. And this is why it's so important that we um, are aware of this and we're practicing stress management techniques, especially one, if we have a mood disorder and two, if we have a physical, um, a different physical condition like um, diabetes or hypertension. And I'll tell you why. Okay, so you get in this stressed state for whatever reason that may be, and you get into your flight, your sympathetic nervous system. Well, your body is thinking you need to run from that bear. We don't have bears anymore. We have emails. We have children that may not be doing what they're supposed to do or spouses that aren't listening to us or more on our plate than we have to do. So our body goes into that same state. What happens is we drop epinephrine and norepinephrine um, and cortisol into our bodies because we need the energy to get out of here. Our eyes dilate so we can see really, you know, see well, um, our heart starts racing so we can pump blood to all of our organs and our muscles and get us moving. We also um, drop uh, glucose into our systems to give our muscles energy. Um, our breathing goes faster and our digestion completely shuts down because you don't need to be digesting food when you're going to be somebody else's food or you're stressing out about the 15 emails that you just got in your project that's done at the end of the day. So that's why you'll get a stomach ache when you're under times of stress. And sometimes about 80% of the population stress eats and about 20% of them doesn't eat at all. But one way or the other, we usually have a stomach ache no matter what we do. Okay, so that's what happens when you get really stressed. But what happens in the time when you're on that beach vacation and you're laying out um, on your little cabana bed and hanging out with the loved your loved ones? That's when you go into that rest and digest and things calm down. Um, and it's essentially the opposite of your sympathetic nervous system. So it's good to have both. But if we're chronically in the sympathetic nervous system, that can be really, really bad for our health, both mentally and physically. Um, because if you have a diagnosis of a heart disease or diabetes, to constantly have your heart rate um, elevated or to have glucose dropping into your system all the time and having elevated blood sugar, um, that's not that's not good. And it's also not good for our brain to be to be in that state as well. However, I have bad news and I always have good news for that. Um, breath work is one of the easiest free, you can do anywhere solutions to get out of fight or flight and get into rest and digest. And it works so quickly. And I don't have any medications that I can give you that are this effective without any side effects, um, and don't have long-term side effects with it as well. So there's two different um, breathwork exercises I'd like to show you. One um, is four, seven, eight, and the other is square breathing. So four, seven, eight, you breathe in for four, you hold for seven, and you exhale for eight. Both of these are um, just as effective. Um, 
it's just maybe one's easier for you to remember, or maybe you like taking bigger, deep breaths and longer exhales than you do shorter. It's really preference. Um, the square breathing is actually taught to Navy SEALs. Um, so when they are under times of stress, they're on a mission, whatever that may be, um, they can get their body to be um, physically, physiologically calm to be able to not have stress shut off their executive thinking in their brain and not be able to make the smartest decisions. So this is really impactful because when our brain is under a lot of stress, that frontal lobe, the place where you make your best decisions, clear, um, uh, very much like calculated decisions, when we're under stress, that completely goes offline. That's why you get this foggy thinking. So that's why it's so important for Navy SEALs, these are life and death situations, to be able to be as clear headed and physically able as possible. So they do square breathing. You breathe in for four, you hold for four, you breathe out for four, you hold for four. The nice thing about this is it's all fours, so it's very easy to remember. So when you're in a time of stress, you don't have to remember, oh, wait, was I supposed to breathe in for five or seven or eight? I'm not, I can't remember. Just four. Think of it as box or square breathing. And again, as we talked about right here, where we have the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, practicing this breath work gets you out of all this stress over here that I was talking about um, and into parasympathetic rest where you were able to digest the food as you lay on the beach and enjoy your chips and salsa or your treat of choice. Okay. And so when we do this, I talked about epinephrine and norepinephrine. This is, these are all your flight and cortisol, insulin, get you ready, your muscles ready to go ghrelin, this is what makes you hungry. So your body gets this appetite that I need to eat. This is why we see some people stress eating because your body is thinking, I need to protect you. If you're going to be racing away from all of this stress all the time, I need lots of energy. We're going to make sure your appetite is up. So you're continuing to eat. Um, so all of these are very protective of us. Unfortunately, they never, they didn't know we would have this world where we have phones beeping at us and computers beeping at us and um, all these different things coming at us all the time. We really live a very busy life now with lots of ways to distract and get our, our um, and request attention from us. Um, and there's just stressors in the world that maybe um, we didn't have before or in different ways. Um, and so we don't need to have these systems alarming all the time, but yet we are. Um, and I talked about why, you know, what's happening here and that brain fog and the decreased gut um, motility here. Um, okay, but let's, what about that sweet rest and digest that we want? Well, it's interesting. So oxytocin, um, it is uh, tagged as the cuddle hormone or the love hormone. This is what plays a role in our bonding. Um, when a woman gives birth, her body is essentially just um, bathed in this hormone um, when she has that child. This is, um, I mean, it's called the cuddle or the love hormone for a reason. This is most certainly our calm state, our rest state, our digest state. And this really, when we're in this state, then we also get growth hormone, which is really important for our bodies um, in terms of repair and building. So again, we can't just always be in that stress state. We do sometimes need to be in that, um, but not chronically. Okay. What are some other things that we can do? Um, yoga. So um, remember how I was talking about that wheel of all the things I could do, we could do and breath work was in there and movement was in there. Well, yoga combines those two things. So you're moving while you're controlling your breath. And it's also very meditative. So really you're getting a three for one. It can also help when you have thoughts of rumination. So think about when you've woken up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about something maybe you need to do or that you didn't do. Um, and having these constant thoughts in our brain really um, can be a, 
either lead us to have a lot of anxiety or can also be a symptom of depression and, and anxiety. Maybe you're just focused on one worry and you can't get it out of your mind. It just keeps going and going and going. And so we have good randomized control trials showing um, a benefit in terms of depression and anxiety using yoga as a therapy. I also do yoga as a therapy um, for post-traumatic stress disorder. So the VA does this um, with veterans who have come home um, and have been traumatized. Um, yoga therapy has been very good um, for them as well and shown in the research. And then acupuncture, this has been used for centuries in Asia and nearly all disease states. Um, the World Health Organization recognized acupuncture as an effective treatment for mild to moderate depression. So again, something rooted in science enough to get the World Health Organization to come out and say this. Um, and not only does it help mood, so depression, anxiety, it also helps with sleep. And it seems like overall quality of life the one thing about um, acupuncture is a lot of communities have like a community acupuncture um, center. So it's very low cost and easy to get into. So if this is something that you're interested or want to explore, um, look and see if you have a community acupuncture center. There are individual practitioners as well. That tends to be a little bit more expensive, um, but there's options for, um, for whichever you're wanting to look into. And then mindfulness apps. So we talked about the books with John Kabat-Zinn. We talked about mindfulness-based stress reduction. We've talked about breath work. Um, there is an app for that. <laughs> so Headspace has lots of breathing apps, has sleep stories. We see that with Calm too. 10% um, happier, Stop, Breathe, and Think, Insight Timer. So all of these are tools that you can use. And maybe this is something that you download one of these apps and you do one of the exercises where you go outside and take a 10 minute mental health break, sit in the sun, maybe go for a walk, maybe just um, close your door and turn off the lights in your office. But there are lots of great tools out there to use. Okay, so let's talk about nutrition. So the one thing that I want to say about nutrition is nutrition studies um, are very interesting because really our best studies come from those that are on a metabolic ward. And what that means is that um, nutrition studies historically can be very complex and um, impacted by a lot of things unless you have all the participants on a hospital ward where they are given the exact same food for sure they know that because it's given to them by the researchers and that they know they're not eating anything else or they're not exercising or they can control for all of these um, different factors. And we do have some of those really, really good studies. Um, but some studies in nutrition aren't, and there's a lot of like um, nutrition wars. And so it gets very confusing. But I really like this um, quote by Michael Pollan that says, um, e food not too much, mostly plants, meaning unprocessed foods, right? Um, that's like, if we just wanted to have one statement, that would be my vote for this statement. Um, his book in the defense of food, um, I like. I think this is why we get so confused on what we're supposed to be eating because it's not about nourishing our bodies, you know, the, the media, the marketing, advertising, it doesn't seem like the biggest message is how do we nourish our bodies to feel good and be out playing with our grandkids or playing with our kids or living till we're a hundred in our home with no cognitive impairment and walking about every day. Um, that's, we need to be worried about food for nourishment, not for the taco cleanse, the fast diet, the new me diet. No, the me right now is perfect. I don't need a new me and no food is going to make me a new me. And then you see wording like perfect body diet or lose your belly. I don't want to lose my belly. I have, my belly is just fine the way it is. Um, and there's just something for everybody. I mean, you can see over here down on the bottom left, 
um, the maker's diet. This is clearly the religious person's diet. Um, the, I mean, it's just, there's so much nonsense out there. Um, and it just, I think the messaging um, gets very, one, confusing, and two, um, demeaning to us, and um, three, like, we have to fit into a box, and that's not true, um, but what we do eat is impactful, and that's to be strong and happy and healthy, um, not to have a new me or um, the, you know, fast metabolism, the body detox diet. Well, why? Okay. So as you can see for the first time, um, we now have dietary, um, the way that we're eating um, has now become a greater risk factor in terms of death than tobacco. Um, and this happened a few years ago. So of all the preventable um, things that we do as humans, tobacco has always been the top of preventable cause of death. Um, and now dietary risk, um, meaning the foods that we eat has surpassed that. And that's because we see eating a very highly processed diet um, ends up leading to a lot of sequela in terms of chronic health conditions. Okay, so why am I talking about this in mental health talk? Well, if we don't feel physically well, that impacts um, our mental health. So we see if you have a chronic disease, you're more likely to have a mood disorder too. And I really, I never like to think as the mind is a different part of our body. Our brain is an organ, just like our heart and our lungs. Um, so we need to be caring for all of them. Um, just like we, we would our heart, we need to care for our brain. So of course, what we eat is going to be very important. But also we see what we eat in terms of research and good research. There's some interesting findings in terms of mood and really we're just kind of at the beginning. So our microbiome, this is also a buzzword I think with mindfulness, mindfulness and microbiome. Somebody's probably gonna combine those into some sort of treatment at some point, but our microbiome um, is full of all of these bugs. We'll just, uh, We'll, we'll not go too deep into the science, but they've got all these bugs in them and you have good bugs and bad bugs. So the bad bugs are the ones when you take antibiotics and you're trying to get wipe those out and then you end up wiping out some of the good ones too. But we want less bad and better and more good. And we know to get diverse, so many, which is better for our health, the more diverse my, our microbiome is, the better. Um, and the, the least of our bad players, we they feed on fiber. The good microbiome, the good gut bugs feed on fiber. So think of like grains, um, brown rice and farro and quinoa and oatmeal and, um, and then sweet potatoes and potatoes and um, fruits and vegetables. All of our whole foods essentially that are full of fiber is just the best thing that we can do in having a diverse microbiome. Um, and we know we can see an interve an interventional data showing increased fiber intake improves mood disorders. And again, I think we're just at the beginning of learning what we're going to find out about the microbiome. Um, but this seems to be um, this seems to be one of the exciting parts of research in terms of having um, more fiber in our diet, more di diversity in microbiome is improving in terms of overall physical health, including brain health. Another reason why that is, is because we see um, short chain fatty acids that you get when you're eating um, unprocessed foods, um, they uh, help in terms of a healthier microbiome. Okay, then here's another reason um, to be eating uh, foods that are unprocessed or including them into your diet. Um, are monoamines, so a monoamines their serotonin and dopamine are controlled by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. Essentially what this does is it breaks down excess monoamines. And we know that depressed brains have elevated levels of monoamines. So we have medications that do the same thing and you may have heard of them. They're called MAOI inhibitors. Unfortunately, like most of our medications, there's some side effects that come with that. 
Now, I want to make this very, very clear. Medications are fantastic and they can save lives. Um, so this most certainly is not saying that um, if we eat broccoli, we don't need to take any of our medications. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, what it means is that there's all these tools that we can use to put together. And for some people using lifestyle um, treatments that we're talking about, like nutrition and movement and community and sleep, all of those things are enough to manage their mood. Um, but for some people, all of those things are fantastic with the addition of medications and weaving those all together is really the best treatment. So I don't want it to be that medications don't have the, their place. We're just talking about all the things that you can do in terms of helping your mood. So for the MAOI inhibitors, these are actually medications we don't use very much because they have so many side effects. Um, and you have to be very careful of the foods that you eat because you can have a hypertensive crisis. Well, but what if there were foods that I could include in my diet that have some of the same impact as those medications that can have um, terrible side effects? And we do have those. We have apples and berries and grapes and onions and green tea. Um, and those have photonutrients that naturally inhibit MAOIs. And then we also see this um, with herbs um, and spices like cloves, oregano, cinnamon, and nutmeg. So really I'm thinking, okay, these are all these like, all these tools that we can use. So this means I can have this nice bowl of oatmeal in the morning with raspberries and cinnamon on it, has lots of fiber, great for the microbiome that I talked about, great for digestive health, great for giving me long sustaining energy. And then I get these phytonutrients um, that naturally inhibit MAOI and phytonutrients are good for so many other reasons. So it's just like, this is like, paying over and over and over again for something as simple and easy as eating a delicious bowl of oatmeal with your choice of fruit on the top of it. Um, and berries are our highest antioxidant foods. So thinking of decreasing anti-inflammatory, um, it's, it's an anti-inflammatory food. Um, so always the good news. What is the good news and what can I add in? Um, we don't want this to be, um, scarcity or taking away, what are great things that we can add in and maybe crowd out some of the things that aren't so good for our health. And then brain derived neurotropic factor. So this is called, this is BDNF for short. And this is very, very interesting, the research that they have on BDNF. So essentially um, we have evidence that BDNF plays a role in human depression and BDNF controls the growth of new nerve cells which may explain atrophy of certain specific brain areas with low levels among depressed patients. So they've actually given um, depressed patients high, um, high BDNF diets and they've done CT scans and they've seen regrowth in areas that had atrophy before. It's really, really fascinating. So what are the ways that we increase BDNF? Because there are ways outside of food and there's with food. And we see with exercising, so it's always great to have a movement practice and fasting, you can increase BDNF, but also food. So a diet, um, high flavonoids appears to be protectively associated with symptoms of depression. And the Harvard's nurses study, which was a huge study. So when you're looking at research studies, if that's something that you do, there are a few things that you wanna look at because there's a lot of research studies that say lots of things. But the ones that are um, really we should pay attention to um, are always uh, large. So the more people in it, the better, and for a considerable amount of time. So two weeks, three weeks, even three, four, five, six months. Um, that's a small, I mean, that's short time, really, if you can get a study that's over years. And they had that with the Harvard's nervous, nurses study and also had thousands of women in this study. And they noticed that high intake of flavonoids appear to reduce the risk of depression. Okay, what are flavonoids though? <laughs> and how do I include them in my food? And what else did we see in this research? So they're naturally occurring in plants. And one of the questions that they were looking at is, 
how do we know the benefits are from the flavonoids and not just from eating healthier overall? I mean, I think we know in general, when you're eating a healthier diet, you typically feel better for a number of reasons. Maybe your stomach doesn't hurt. You don't have a headache. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why when we eat healthy, we feel a little bit better. Well, they took a randomized control trial. So again, when we're looking at studies, I talked about length and size. Also, you want it to be randomized and there always to be a control group. Um, this was over 18 weeks. They had three groups. And so they did high flavonoid fruits and vegetables, low flavonoid fruits and vegetables, and no extra fruits and vegetables. And what they saw was only the high flavonoid group got a significant boost in BDNF levels, which corresponded to improvement in cognitive performance. The BDNF boost um, helps explain why each additional um, serving of fruits and vegetables is associated with a 3% decrease in the risk of depression. So again, I'm talking about how there's all these things that we can combine together. Okay, so we eat better and then we sleep better. And that's, you know, double power. We have community with our friends and um, we have purpose and meaning. Okay, that stacks up on top of it. So, you know, you get 3% here and 10% here and 20% there. This is where, again, that whole circle comes in terms of being whole, happy, healthy people. And here's a little chart. Um, if you would like to screenshot this or take a picture of it um, to include these in your diet. So I talked about having um, high fibrous foods. We talked about um, MAOI, berries were in there, right? Um, and so here you see two high flavonoid foods include blackberries, blueberries, raspberries. So here's that yummy oatmeal that you're gonna eat in the morning, apples and strawberries, grapes, plums, so fruit, fruit. Um, and then salad, like red leaf um, lettuce, red cabbage, onions, peppers, radishes, eggplant, spinach, cherry tomatoes, asparagus. So I think of this as, okay, we have that yummy bowl of oatmeal. For lunch, we could have a big salad with onions and peppers and leafy greens. Um, or you could do like a whole grain sandwich with um, all the veggies on it and your protein of choice or just have it a veggie sandwich. Um, and then dinner, you could do some grilled asparagus and cherry tomatoes with a protein of choice there as well. Um, and that's a full day full of fiber and flavonoids, um, anti-inflammatory properties, helps in terms of chronic disease. Um, because remember that uh, our diet is, um, is causing so many um, chronic diseases and premature death. Um, so just a great way to be able to put things together. Let me just take this chart and we'll just add some things. And the low flavonoid foods, this doesn't mean that these are bad. This is just in terms of when we're looking at BDNF, these are the ones that they noticed the highest bang for your buck. You still wanna eat all of these other ones on the right as well. Okay, what are some other ways? A teaspoon of turmeric may boost BDNF levels more than 50% within a month. Um, this is consistent with other randomized controlled trials that have been done before as well. And then nuts. So the Predimed study, also a randomized control study, sent weekly batches of nuts or extra virgin olive oil to subjects. And the nut group, decrease their risk of BDNF levels by 78%. Sorry, they decrease their risk of having low BDNF levels by 78%. Um, and we can see that a single high fat meal can drop BDNF levels within hours. So, um, okay, now we're gonna have that day that I gave you a food to eat. Now let's add in for our snack, we have some nuts there. Um, and then turmeric. Turmeric is a fantastic anti-inflammatory um, uh, spice. And you can put that in some hot water and some put some lemon in there and a little bit of honey um, and kind of make your own little tea. Um, and you could drink that in the morning or whenever. Uh, so again, little tools that you can use here. And then the anti-inflammatory diets, the Mediterranean diet, we really see this being impactful in terms of health for brain um, and physical health. And you can take um, a little test to see what your score would be um, in terms of how close you are to an anti-inflammatory diet, um, or is there a place that you could add in something else? So uh, you look for how many vegetables you're eating, 
um, how many legumes, nuts, seeds, fish, fats, um, alcohol, and uh, red and processed meat. Um, so take a screenshot of this, add it up and see, okay, nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect. Um, where are the places that I could improve? Or maybe I'm doing fantastic and I don't need to improve anywhere. Um, but just fun to take a little quiz and see where you are there. What else do we see? Like, okay, what a, more evidence. What is more evidence that I should do this, <laughs> that I should be eating my oatmeal and my raspberries and my asparagus and um, cherry tomatoes, and I should be moving and sleeping and having community? Why are all of these things that I keep repeating? Well, the blue zones are um, places around the world where people have been, uh, people live to be, sorry, blue zones are our highest pockets of concentration around the world where people live to be 100 years or older. And these people that are living to be 100 years or older, um, are they're not in care centers. They're in their homes. They still have their mind with them. They're motoring about. They're doing all of their things. And so researchers were really interested why are there little pockets around the world and do they have anything in common? Are there any similarities? And so we see blue zones in um, Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Loma Linda, California, in Costa Rica. And it, okay, why, why is somebody living in Loma Linda is having the same health outcomes as somebody in Sardinia, Italy? I mean, they're not even close to being in the same um well, they're not in the same country, they're not um, being raised in the same culture, everything couldn't be different. Well, what they noticed when they took um, all of their observations after researching these groups of people is that they all had a lot of things in common. And this is what it, this is what it looked like. So they all moved, they had some sort of movement. So remember at the beginning, I said, if you don't like exercise, that's fine. You don't need to exercise, have this formal exercise plan. Um, exercise is fantastic for us, please don't get me wrong. Um, but it's not that the people in Sardinia, Italy were going to 24 hour fitness or Orange Theory or Vasa and had this structured program. They're just continually motoring about in the world. Some of them just really don't have the modern conveniences we have here, like being able to order chip and crumble cookies from our iPhones and have it delivered um, as much as we want. You know, if they want a cookie, they have to walk down to the bakery and get it, um, or they have to make it themselves. So they have to go to the grocery store, which is usually a little market because they don't, they go to the market multiple times a week. Um, they don't have a Costco to fill up a giant fridge. You have to go down there, get your ingredients, go home. Um, and make that. And they probably don't have a mixer. They have to hand mix it. It's just much more movement um, in, in their lives. Um, and they have purpose. Um, they also take more time to rest. So if you've ever been to Europe, a lot of places in Europe shut down um, in the afternoon because that's when people have lunch and take a nap. They also open much later. Um, and then they have these long dinners with their community and their family. They eat and they're together um, sharing their lives. They take longer vacations. We know a lot of um, countries in Europe get a mandatory month off in, um, in the summer or they take a month off for holiday. They also eat until they're about 80% full. And again, we see this, there's this common theme of what Michael Pollan said, um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So they're eating food, they're not eating too much and they're eating mostly plants. Um, and then they have healthy social networks. If you don't show up somewhere, somebody's gonna come find you and check on you that day. Family is a huge priority to them. Um, and they're very connected with um, a higher power, a spirituality or a religious practice. Okay, and then alcohol. Alcohol is somewhat of um, the seductive mistress because alcohol, you might have this temporary feeling of euphoria and happiness and kind of that eat and drink, be merry, um, a situation going on. And the reason why is because you get this temporary increase in turning over of serotonin. 
But long-term, you get diminished levels of serotonin, serotonin and catecholamines, meaning you end up feeling worse in the, in the long run. It's kind of like um, stealing from Peter to pay Paul. You're, you're borrowing from later and then the bank account goes down and it's not being replenished. Um, and we have numerous studies where there's an improvement in, de um, in depression with the elimination of alcohol. And if this is interesting for you, like the consideration of hmm, maybe I should take a little bit of a break from alcohol or decrease my usage, um, there is a website called um, One Year No Beer. And it doesn't just have to be beer. Um, it can be any form of alcohol. Um, and there's a community on there. They have like a challenge if you want to go a week or a month. Um, the, the guy that started it, his story is really interesting on why he decided to do one year no beer and why this is like become a movement and um, a resource for people. He has a podcast um, on iTunes on Rich Roll, um, one year no beer. So if that's of interest of you, um, take a look at that and see what you think. And again, little, little tidbits and little tools here. And then um, anxiety, preventing anxiety. So this is, um, this is the prescription I give to people in the clinic um, is an anxiety prevention pill, if you will. Um, so you want to maximize foods that are rich in omega-3s, B vitamins, and folic acid, um, have a regular exercise routine, limit your screen time. We know that the um, average amount of time that somebody will be on their time, their phone from birth to death is about six years. If you take the average amount of screen time that Americans are consuming social media at right now. Um, and I always imagine on, on your deathbed, if somebody said, I could give you six years of your life back, would that be something you were willing to give up? And for me, it would be, I would love to have those six years of life back. So um, this doesn't mean you don't have to have any screen time, but just being considerate of your consumption of it and mindful. There's also um, ways to limit screen time by taking breaks. We see people that take breaks, their mood improves. There was a great study out of, I think the University of San Francisco, I'm sorry if I'm misremembering that right now, where they took college kids, took a break from social media, moods all improved. Um, and so something to consider daily journaling, discontinuing cell phones an hour before bre um, bedtime. That's because the blue light that comes from your um, phone is very activating to the brain. And um, it also um, melatonin, which is released um, to help us get sleepy, um, it inhibits that. So um, makes it more difficult for your melatonin levels to rise for you to go to sleep. Um, and then sleep is so impactful, getting at least seven to eight hours minimum of sleep at night. Okay, let's talk about exercise. Um, so I've been talking about how you just wanna be moving, um, but exercise is just, there just seems to be benefit after benefit after benefit. And I could do a whole hour on the benefits of exercise. I probably could do an hour on just the cognitive benefits, then an hour on the um, cardiovascular benefits, an hour on the muscular benefits, stability, not falling, you know, it goes on and on and on. But let's just talk about mood. And I'm just going to highlight a few of my favorite studies and um, just to really kind of give an idea of how powerful this is. Um, so Duke University did a study and they took two groups of people. So remember, we want two different groups of people. We want them to be randomized. We want to be controlled for. And um, one group took medication. So they took Zoloft, this is a first line medication for depression. And then one group exercised. And what they saw is that both groups within four months noted improvement in depression and exercise. Um, so the exercise group was just as comparable to medication. Um, the thing about it was, is the exercise group was a little bit slower to feeling better than the medication group. However, the exercise group had, um, when they kept following them and did follow up, they did better long term than the medication group, which I think is really interesting. But then the scientists asked a very important question. Because remember, when I was talking about nutrition, a lot of things can um, impact the research that you get back. Like what, what other thing could have impacted this that's making the study invalid or not valid? And um, 
one of the things that they thought about is, well, our exercise group, they were exercising together. Remember when I was talking about the blue zones and community and having people and being together, that really is important for our mood too. So now we have an exercise group that was exercising together. How do we know it was the exercise and not just getting together, getting out of your house, being with other people? So they were smart and did a good job and went back and they did the study again, but with three groups. So this time they had the medication group, they still kept the group exercisers, and then they had an at-home exercise group. And the at-home exercise group, same, same. There wasn't a change in terms of beneficial outcomes, whether you were exercising with a group or exercising at home. Exercise was still um, comparable to medication. And then remember that BDNF, I said that there's fasting and there's food and there's exercise. So starting an hour a day exercise regimen um, and within three months, you can get a quadrupling of BDNF release from your brain. So please, 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 if you have not been exercising, do not start an hour a day regimen um, right out the gate. Start with maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes twice a week um, and work up as you are able. Um, this was quite a bit, but again, we're seeing how these are very useful tools. And then a study of 5,000 people across the country found that those who regularly exercise had 25% lower odds of major depressive disorder. And the thing that, I, again, I want to say is that getting outside and just walking, something very low impact, completely free, getting out and having fresh air, that is, that's movement, that's exercise. So please don't feel like you need to be joining CrossFit tomorrow. And then green exercise. So exercise is amazing. Think about exercise is the king and the ace. If we can go any higher than the king is um, getting out and having outdoor exercise. And you may have heard of this as forest bathing. This also could be another hour long talk. I have actually attended an hour long talk on green exercise at a lifestyle medicine conference and the evidence behind um, getting into nature and the benefits, um, not only physically, but mentally. So if able and when you can stack this on top of your exercise and again, more bang for your buck, it's like getting um, the designer clothes at the discount price or getting your the most prized car um, for the Honda, the Honda Civic price, you get the Mercedes for the Honda Civic price. Um, okay, in community. So being connected, I've talked about this throughout, is so important. We see the isolation, loneliness, lack of social connection. Um, they're steadily rising um, and it's creating this um, epidemic. And um, I don't think we really have to question this anymore because we saw it play out globally during the pandemic, how um, sadly not in not a good way, very painfully um, impactful it was to be separated from our communities. 30% um, of older adults reported loneliness and 58% of Americans often feel like no one in their life knows them well. One interesting thing um, about scientists who are researching loneliness um, and trends in terms of how we connect with others have been asking people, okay, if you, so this has been going on for decades. So a few decades ago, um, they would ask if something were to happen, like your child got sick at daycare and somebody needed to go pick them up and you couldn't, or you got in a car accident, how many people could you call um, to go pick up your kid or come get you when your car broke down? And the average answer was about two. However, when they've redone this study, um, most recently, the average number is zero people. So we feel like we're more connected. However, it seems like we're becoming more and more disconnected as a society. And that we see that this is really um, impactful in terms of our mental health and in terms of our physical health. So we see um, 
lack of social support, infrequent, um, meaningful connections, having negative feelings about your relationships with others, poor physical and mental health, a lack of balance in daily activities, doing too much or too little of any given thing. Um, and so just something to consider. Am I spending enough time away from work and doing things I need with those people that are going to fill up my bucket, the things that are I find meaningful, the people that give me back and I feel fulfilled after I've been with them. And um, we see in people that are connected, lower levels of anxiety and depression, blood pressure and heart rates improve, um, even with short positive social interactions. Um, gives us higher self-esteem, greater empathy for others. Um, our brain, uh, having a more alert young brain increases our longevity. So people who stay socially active have longer lifespans. So remember the blue zones, we saw this play out. We see this play out in populations across the world. Again, the best science we have is long-term science and I mean, these populations, we are talking about decades and decades and decades, um, strengthens your immune system. So genes impacted by loneliness also code for immune function and inflammation. And what can you do? Okay, because so we're talking about all these things. What can you do? Volunteering. Remember how I talked about green exercise, how that's the like extra bonus, the ace in the car, the ace in the hole, the ace of the card deck in terms of um, being a uh, two for one there. Well, volunteering, when we give, there is a very powerful return in terms of how we feel um, and benefits on our mental health. And so volunteering, giving to others, you can find a community doing that. Let's say you love animals and you want to um, volunteer at a shelter. So you're getting the benefit of just giving and then you're having meaning and purpose because you're doing something that you um, that you're very interested in. And then you're gonna meet like-minded people and develop connections there as well. Joining a fitness class or a walking group. Again, we're stacking these habits on top of each other. You're gonna get the movement and community together. Um, and then there's local community centers. Get involved with local events. Do you play an instrument? Is there a local band you could join? Um, or uh, music performances, lectures, art displays. Um, there's a, an app called um, Meetup and you can find, if you like knitting with cats on Thursdays while watching rom-coms, there's probably a group for that. <laughs> so um, one way, if you're like, I don't even know how to do that, um, there's an app for that. Okay, and then sleep. Oh man, see all of these, I could do an hour on, but sleep, sleep is so impactful. And let me just give you um, one little uh, example why. So the Hamilton D uh, scale is a clinically validated tool that clinicians, including myself, use um, to determine how depressed somebody may be. And so on average, when somebody starts taking medication, they get about a three point improvement in their Hamilton D scale or score. But if somebody starts sleeping well, they get about a six point improvement. So again, this is not that medications aren't good. This is just, we have all of these other tools that we can use with medications if needed, or maybe before we start medications, there's just lots of tools that we can be using. We, we're not have to just use one, um, depending on your situation. And this is a conversation to have with your clinician um, and, and make with your healthcare professional. But again, sleep, that's, that's so huge and impactful in terms of our mood. Um, and you know what happens when we're getting good sleep? We reduce our risk of Alzheimer's. We have better mood, improved memory, improved attention and concentration. We maintain a healthy weight, um, crucial for functioning of our immune system. And then you kind of see the flip side of if we are chronically not sleeping or have insomnia, it worsens our mood disorders. We feel sleepy and um, hard to process cognitive impacts, impairment during the day. Um, we get hormone abnormalities and it can um, be a risk factor for obesity, cardiovascular disease, weakened immune system, type two diabetes. So, okay, well, what can I do to improve my sleep? 
And so what we know is there are many, many things that you can do, but this is the tip that I always give people. And you probably won't be able to do all of them, but what could you start doing and then add on? And so I want you to think of your sleep as a 24 hour clock. So not just what we do right before we go to bed or within an hour or two before going to bed, um, but there's that affect our sleep. There's so many other things that we can be doing. So when you wake up in the morning, I want you to think, okay, what am I going to do right now when I wake up? It's going to make me sleep good tonight. We're really going to be proactive here. Okay, well, here's why. So we have a circadian rhythm, right? Our body has this natural clock. Every single cell in our body goes off a circadian rhythm. So when we wake up in the morning, melatonin, which we've all heard of melatonin because you can take melatonin supplements to help you sleep at night. When we wake up in the morning, cortisol should be high. So cortisol is a stress hormone, but it's also a hormone that's good for us. It's but it's not good to be chronically elevated. It's good to be elevated in the morning when we're getting going, because that's what it's doing for us. It's getting us ready for the day, essentially turning on the engine. Here we go, we're getting ready to, to get moving. And melatonin should be going down and be at its lowest. So how can we make sure that those hormones in the morning are optimized? And there are three things that we can do. One, we can get some movement. So going for a walk, getting some exercise. Two, we can get outside and get natural sunlight into our eyes. So please don't look directly into the sun, um, uh, but you just want to have unobstructed sunlight into your eyes. So meaning don't wear sunglasses, don't wear a hat for 10 minutes on a sunny day or 20 to 30 minutes on a cloudy day. What happens is this, um, the sunlight that we get into our eyes decreases our cortisol or increases our cortisol, decreases our melatonin. You actually, depending on the time of day, there's a different impact on your, um, on your sleep wake cycle. So we'll talk a little bit about it, but the morning sunlight is very impactful for what I just said. Then if you can do some sort of cold exposure, so think about taking a one minute cold shower you get this drop of dopamine and you get long-term benefits of increased mood and concentration for at least the next four hours. So first thing in the morning, if you can get movement, sunlight into your eyes and some cold exposure, like a one minute cold shower, you are like prime and ready to set yourself up for sleep for the rest for that evening. Okay, as your day goes on, you wanna have bright lights in your eyes. This is again, why we don't want bright lights in our eyes at night, because it's too activating. But during the day, bright lights are great. If you can um, withhold your coffee consumption for 90 to 120 minutes um, after you wake up, there seems to be an improvement in terms of that afternoon crash that you get. And the reasoning behind that is that if you're drinking it first thing when you get up, there's a thought that it's impacting the natural, um, the natural hormones that we have going on that are trying to set or be part of our circadian rhythm. Um, drinking coffee though, when we drink caffeine, so any caffeine, um, what happens is that we actually shut down production of adenosine and adenosine builds up throughout our day um, and that's what helps make us, makes us sleepy at night it is also when cortisol goes down and melatonin goes up. So be um, mindful of the last time you drink caffeine. Um, you need to have about eight hours before adenosine is not being impacted in terms of um, not helping you sleep at night. So if you can, don't drink caffeine within eight hours of going to bed at night. That can be too long for some people. So maybe that's five hours or four hours, but just knowing why, that's why. Okay, so we did the things in the morning or in bright lights, maybe withholding our cup of coffee for an hour and a half, being wise about our caffeine usage. And then when the sun starts going down, you want to think of start turning everything down. This is when you don't want bright lights in your eyes. So. Um, using lamps or floor lights instead. 
um, turning, not having computers or telephones or screens in your eyes um, at least two hours before bedtime and having this um, bedtime routine where you do something relaxing, like maybe taking a hot bath, drinking some um, herbal tea, reading a book, spending time cuddling with a loved one, listening to music that you enjoy. Um, this is very, very, very helpful in terms of getting um, our cortisol to come down because we're reducing the stress hormone and having our melatonin um, naturally rise in our body. And we talked about alcohol. Alcohol can be very impactful for our sleep in a negative way. So we don't end up getting into deep REM sleep um, like we would without having alcohol. So our sleep that's so important, especially the first hours of sleep um, that we do the most remodeling, that's impacted by alcohol where we don't get into that deep sleep. Okay, so um, I, this is pretty much what I went over um, and you have this that you can look at. Um, also, if you are doing all the right things and you continue to struggle with insomnia, um, one of the best treatments out there is CBTI. So it's cognitive behavioral health, um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. I've seen this work miracles. So you can look online, there's resources and there's groups and um, uh, therapists that can help with this. Um, very, very, very helpful. Um, and then just some other resources for you to look at. And then food, we'll go back to food. Um, we wanna avoid large meals before we go to bed. 150 calories snack before bed is great. You just don't wanna be eating a large meal before you go to bed. And think something um, light, like um, fruit, like pineapple, oranges, bananas, kiwis, um, tart cherry juice, but they also can help you sleep because they have natural melat uh, melatonin content. Also, um, just three pistachios has the same amount of melatonin that our body naturally makes. So having um, some seeds, pistachios, pumpkin seeds, cashews also help because they're rich in potassium and magnesium and um, melatonin. So um, some great ideas to have before bed and then drinking lemon balm or chamomile tea. Okay, I, I'm so happy that you were here to join me um, and listen to this. If you need anything or have any questions, I am happy, um, happy to hear from you. Please reach out. Uh, thank you so much.